Pandora is all about getting you the right music, and Living Social is all about getting you the best deals to do cool things in your town. Whether it's dining out, getting pampered, or having an adventure, Living Social wants to make sure you're doing it for at least 50%.
start getting going that way, and then um, and then let you all chime in with questions as you have them. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. I don't know what I would have done if you'd all said no. By the way. <laughs> um, all right. So I'll start. I'll let you all introduce yourself. Hi everyone. My name is Megan Geyser, and I'm CEO of Her Interactive. And our mission is to create inspiring interactive entertainment for girls of all ages. Um, we're the pioneer in games targeted towards females back in 1995, and we do the Nancy Drew series. Great. And I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> uh, my name is Nicole Lazaro, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, I run Zeo Design uh, for the past uh, 20 years, and essentially I do consulting, or we do consulting. Uh, we make games more fun. Uh, we have uh, clients uh, everywhere from uh, Sony to EA, Ubisoft, Play First. We've worked on three in the Mist series, nearly all of the Diana Dashes. And uh, we have our own iPhone game uh, called Tilt Flips Adventure and 1.5 Dimensions, which we'll be uh, uh, launching on the iPhone um, for Earth Day. My name is Wendy Lee. I'm the CEO of Get Satisfaction. Get Satisfaction is a network of online customer communities communities that are established either by a consumer, a user, or a company. Um, we have 50,000 communities in the network. We're a freemium model. That means anything. <laughs> the freemium model means a lot to me. Very efficient business model. Um, we have 2,000 paying customers. Uh, the majority of our paying customers are monthly subscriptions. Um, through a credit card, and the rest are large, large companies, very focused on social gaming as a segment. Uh, Zynga, Rocku, just a few examples of customers we serve. Uh, people, companies, and consumers use Get Satisfaction to have conversations with folks that share their passion for a product or service. Companies use Get Satisfaction to reduce their service and support costs, to have a stronger value proposition around satisfaction, to get product feedback, and to do stronger brand loyalty, especially through Facebook. Thank you. So I, th I think just to, to start off, I wanted to ask you all, particularly uh, in experience with game design, you, you guys start with an idea of what you want the gamer to do, right? What you what, what the user is going to do. How do, you, how do you connect that with what they actually want to do, right, before you start building? What are the things that you, you do to engage your user base b before you launch your product? Well, uh, for us, uh, we started our first Nancy Drew PC game back in 97. And uh, we didn't have a lot of money, and we were pretty scrappy. Um, but we all were very committed to high quality. My background is filmmaking, and so we wanted to actually, the Nancy Drew brand is so inspiring, and so we wanted to really bring that to life uh, through a game. So we did a number of things. Um, the first thing we did is uh, get our girls together and have them play games. And most of the games at that time were shooters for guys, because I didn't realize actually there were no games for girls, which was ridiculous. Um, and ask them what they liked and disliked in the games that they were playing. And what we got was such fresh perspectives on what games could be. Uh, they actually helped us to improve on existing gameplay rather than perpetuate gender stereotypes. One thing they said was, um, you know, we said, well, what do you think of Nancy Drew, right? And uh, the girl said, you know, she's, she's great, but she's really too perfect. You know, can you give her acne or something? And then I feel okay <laughs> about playing her. And these kinds of, you know, insightful observations really helped us to shape and, and make those creative judgments to uh, make Nancy Drew, because in our games, you are Nancy Drew, and you get to experience what it is to be brilliant. So we gave her self-deprecating humor, so that even though she's gutsy and smart and she gets the job done, she's also human. You know, it's also challenging. She has to muster courage and all that kind of thing. Um, they also said, you know, when they're playing shooters, they said, hey, we don't, uh, 
we don't mind shooting. It's kind of fun, but we prefer a reason before we shoot. For example, if they were beating up my little sister, I'd be all over them. So for that reason, we put a goal or a mission statement in the beginning of the games because, you know, we wanted to help them understand what, what the, the mystery was they were going to solve. So I think getting that initial um, feedback from the customers you're going after. And we did it. I did, I did use Billy testing in my apartment. You know, it doesn't have to be if you don't have the money. Uh, you know, you can get it done. Um, and also really infusing the brand. You know, we, we not only had to create a fun game, but we also had to make sure that that game preserved the integrity of Nancy Drew brand. And a lot of games, uh, as you know, sometimes just slap on a brand and think that they're going to sell. But the customer's really, you know, smart. And uh, so the balance of the two really took a lot of painstaking attention to detail and quality before we got it right. Were there any places where you were really surprised? Um, like you had an assumption going in that they'd want one thing and you learned that they wanted something completely different that caused you to rethink something fundamental or did you find it to be more confirming and refining? Um, we, a combination of both, um, when we created the Nancy Drew UI, sometimes, uh, you know, we would put it in front of them and they didn't like it. But basically we had achieved creating, uh, bringing the Nancy Drew brand to life in an interactive game. Uh, but there was a lot of iterations along the way, and we had to challenge each other. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of creative chaos in the beginning, whether you're doing a website or a game. And, you know, the trick is really to staying united as a team and having the vision very clear in the beginning, whether it's a website or a game. We, we do a vision brief. And that's who, you know, kind of breaks down who the audience is, what is the concept, uh, what is the brand that we're trying to create, if you're trying to create your own brand in a website. And all of these pieces together um, need to be clarified in the beginning and then in the first initial brainstorming or kickoff meeting where everyone on the team is aligned um, so that as issues come up, you can problem solve and really get to the solution instead of like getting to the skies falling where, you know, you're just not moving forward. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a really good point. I think that what's excellent about uh, the Nancy Drew series is they did, you know, as, as we heard this morning, you listen to their customers and really understand their pain points, or in this case, what, what would create engagement. Um, then we, we would like to, I'd just like to add some things that we did, like for uh, our game, Tilt, uh, which is actually the, it's based on the first game on um, that, on the iPhone to use the accelerometer, which I designed with Joe Hewitt at iPhone DevCamp. So the very first game um, to actually use, you know, the accelerometer, we actually designed. And um, what I noticed is in designing that game is that what we did is we actually looked at what was, what kind of experiences did the iPhone create? So this is not about just games. You know, this is about how does humans create, how do human being, how do we create human engagement? Um, which is why I sort of left interface design and then moved um, into, um, uh, into game design, is because games are self-motivating systems. So it's, uh, it's, it's this unique opportunity. But what I did is I interviewed folks playing, their, playing with their brand new iPhones, you know, waiting in line and then taking them home. And then I, I watched for what did, they really, what did they really enjoy. And they really enjoyed, you know, moving it around, the images. They enjoyed the flipping around, the, 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 you know, the various, the tilting. And, um, but then if I, you know, shared my photos with you, I noticed some other emotions. You know, I noticed the, the pinching and the zooming, you know, the, the stroking, the tapping. And it's a really brilliant uh, aspect of the phone is that um, if you were to do those same gestures on the back of my hand, you know, we better be on a date or something like that. And what the brilliant engineers at Apple have done and the designers is that they've actually baked in social emotions, you know, caretaking and all sorts of emotions into the operating system itself. So the actions that you take with an iPhone actually create an emotional resonance that's a very deep part of the uh, Apple brand. And then what we've been able to, what you can actually do then is, you know, look at these, uh, how these actions create emotion and then uh, use that to actually create, uh, build out an experience that then creates the engagement. Um, and if you've got, what we do is we often have, we have, we have people create what we call a game plan, which is what is a game, but it's your goals, it's your actions, your motivations, and your emotions, you know, G-A-M-E. 
And you use these uh, four systems, you tie them together uh, to actually, you could actually brainstorm, you know, new game mechanics. So if you want to start out with something new, add something new to your website without actually being a game, you can actually just use this sort of matrix uh, way of thinking to uh, increase uh, engagement. Uh, we don't have time to go into it in detail today, but I've got a, um, you know, a TEDx talk and uh, there's uh, white papers and stuff on my website. You can download this game plan. So basically it's a game plan to save the world. Sort of like artists have to do a sketch a day, you know, to kind of warm up, 15 minute kind of sketch. Well, game designers, interface designers, we also need to do that sort of thing. So if you download this, uh, this game plan, you can actually do a sketch a day of a new game that you might want to, you know, that you think might save the world and maybe, you know, we can all do 365 of those and eventually come up with some real cool games that save the world. Anyway, that's, I've done enough talking. So, so, so it sounds like part of what you're saying you need to do before launch is have a clear vision of what you're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. and what the goals are mm -hmm. and then spend time talking to the people that you think are going to use your product to understand what's going to be necessary for them to engage and move towards those goals. And, th and that can be true whatever kind of site it is, whether it's a community media site trying to get people to... Uh, report on the local Chamber of Commerce city government activities or whether it's a game or an iPhone app or anything else. Yeah. And that you want to be sure that the actions that the people take create the emotions that you want. So you can literally, you know, as you, as an, inter we may not uh, think of it this way as interaction design, but game design really is the future of interaction design. The basic mechanics that game designers use in games are actually going to filter in. You know, games have always led interface design, whether it's, you know, the pie menus on The Sims or gestures on the Wii. Everything has often come through games first. And so there's this um, opportunity to, you know, look really explicitly at how these um, interact. And then you can literally paint on engagement um, and color it like Velcro. And then color it with any emotion that you choose to match your brand or the tax task at hand by designing the emotion that is around those verbs you choose. So on the Facebook, they have the like button. And that like button has a certain emotional resonance. So does poke. And the like button is all about, you know, it's just the same as me. What does, it, what does it mean to me for me to like your status post? You know, it's not really a game, but it's, it actually is this sort of me picking out, um, picking a digital flea off of you. So it's a sort of amici or friendly mechanic. And that changes the experience. That then encourages you to do what? Well, eventually you're going to leave a comment. But, like, I, I like that status. You know, I like that you went out to dinner with your friends last night. But then, you know, then you have that, you've broken the ice to, uh, for a deeper engagement. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, um, and it also sounds like that clarity of what you want people to do helps you make sense of the feedback that you're getting, right? So as a team, you're able to make decisions. I think, uh, Wendy, you know quite a bit about getting feedback, I suspect, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> from products once they're going, right? right. And so I, I was wondering if you could talk for, for just a moment about, so you've done this work up front, you launch it, you got a clear idea of what you're working on, but you start... You, what happens when you start getting feedback in the in the real world, right? How do you how do you well, deal with all you of that? Well, you want to pull your hair out <laughs> because you get so much feedback. But so if you're if you're very lucky, that's you right. get so much we, feedback. We are very fortunate. So get get satisfaction is very fortunate that way. I think one of the design principles that our founders instilled in the site that I'm sure everyone here is thinking about, and you guys are expert in, is just making sure you can drive to good productive outcomes mm -hmm. in the spirit of this new social emotional engagement, right? And, and for us, um, those productive outcomes are very important because we didn't want to be a rant site, right? I mean, we didn't want people coming to the site and building a community just to complain, right? <laughs> I mean, there are other sites that do that very well. That wasn't what Thor and Lane, our founders, were trying to do with Get Satisfaction. We were really trying to bring folks together in a very open, trusting environment to exchange um, conversation that was rich and relevant to each other and ultimately to the business. But on the feedback side, um, there's a lot to learn, I think, for businesses of any size to learn about listening, and I don't mean with a listening platform, right? right. Yes. That's a whole nother story. Yeah. But listening so you can engage effectively and how to close loops and when to close loops, right? And how to get back when you can't get the feature you want, right? And there's no way to get it in the product roadmap. 
And, you know, you have to be careful when you're about feedback and you're designing to keep that feedback ongoing, always on. Because we're always on feedback. So when companies use us, put our widget on their site, on their home site, on their home page or on the product page, it's always on. And consumers are constantly giving feedback about, well, I don't like where that is, or that button's not good, or mm -hmm. your service is not right. And mm -hmm. you can get overwhelmed with that. Exactly. So what we try to do and help our clients do, more importantly, cobbler's children sometimes have no shoes, but what we try to do internally is every day gather the feedback from our community. We use our product, pull that in, have that as part of our daily scrum, you know, the top pieces of feedback as part of our daily scrum, see where it's going to fit in, prioritize that properly. I mean, that's probably boring. I mean, this is not a design. This is kind of a business thing. And so, and then find ways, either one to many or many to many, to, to give them updates on that. Right? But I, I think that's also design, too, because, you know, we, we do. I want to be you, you know, guys. No. <laughs> I want to no. do creative no, no, work. I just count things, right? That, but, and make things work, right? But that is very much a part of the creative yeah. process. I mean, and, and the one, you know, thing that is important is that. For the most part, if you have a talented team and you have a good concept and things like that, that's great. But you're not always right. And so we've yeah. learned, you know, over the years, getting right. feedback. We have an advisory board, which is another thing I, I recommend, of 50 to 75 girls and women. <laughs> and for every single game, yes. we uh, have them come in at different times during development to tell us, is the story working for you? Are the puzzles too hard or too easy? Um, you know, and, and really give us, and they are very blunt, uh, which is great. But, and then we go back and take that and figure out, okay, um, I think this resonates, so we'll do some creative tweaking. But it, it's an art form to know how to take their information and know what to throw out and what really are gems that they're giving you. Um, and that's an art. I mean, yeah, that's um, something that we do actually. My my company, Zio Design, uh, and one of the services we provide is uh, is player player testing, player feedback. Mm -hmm. And um, the best thing you can do on your website, your app, your game uh, is have people that haven't experienced, have not experienced that um, your your. Uh, your, your game or your website, and then just run it, you know, run it for the first time without you providing help. Uh, you know, have them ask questions, don't answer them till the end of the session, and then just, just listen and watch them play. It's uh, that experience, because you're, uh, you're taking them through a journey, you're taking them through an experience, and so you'll want to see moment to moment what it is that they, um, that they go for, or they do. Um, you might want to use the forums, in a sense, to identify, like, here are some hotspots, and then complement that with uh, some one-on-one -on -one player testing so that you can see at those moments, well, what was it that was really causing this thing to be too difficult? You know, we get a good sense of why. It's a diff you know, in a sense, like, usability is an awesome discipline. Yes. It really is, it really is totally awesome. But it's also one that is going to be, it's also broken in a very yeah, fundamental sure. way, in that the only emotion that usability most usability practices uh, focus on is uh, frustration. And then it's only to reduce it. Hmm. Where's the emotion of, you know, that sense of accomplishment? Where are the mechanics, the, the research tools that we can use to make people feel like, yes, I just got the, you yeah. know, just won the Grand Prix. Yeah, you know, yeah. where the arms punch the sky. I use the word, Italian word fiero for that. Where are our fiero mechanics? Where can you put that in? So we really call what we do is player experience design. Yeah. Uh, and it's all about looking at looking at loops. You want to close loops. During your session, you want to close loops. You want to have these engagement loops where you go in, you know, you, you, um, you, you, you might, you, the, the curiosity might be the hook that pulls you in. You then find a particular goal. You accomplish that goal. You share it with your friends, and then maybe it changes how you think, feel, and behave. And those four actions are what we call the four keys to fun, and that those create those in, little engagement loops, each of those four, and then all together, going between those different steps creates different emotion sets, and it's something really organic about mm -hmm. how, we, how we are as humans, how we think and feel and behave. Mm -hmm. And if you can provide three out of the four uh, in games, you actually have um, – best-selling games have three out of the four of these, uh, what we call the four keys to fun. So, so, so it sounds like a, a place to start is to make sure you have clear goals about what you want to accomplish, and you've actually taken the trouble to articulate them and make sure they're shared, because I think that's what, that's, sometimes people think they have clear goals, but, but they don't always get them down in a way that's shareable with their team. 
Um, understand where that intersects with your users by doing different kinds of usability testing, asking questions so that you can refine and change and learn exactly. as you're and, getting and ready to build. And feel the player, the people as they play. And, 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 then, and then close loops, right? And closing a loop, I think often we think of feedback as something that we have to say yes or no to. That's right. Right? Yeah. Like, like we, we have to come in and say, yes, you can have that button, or no, I can't afford to put that button on the website. And we, we, tend, we tend to hide from the no. <laughs> yeah, right? right? But you, yeah. you, you have to keep that going. And then throughout that entire arc, be thinking of what is it you want people to be feeling and doing as they're going through this? Do you, do you, want, to, do you want to create a website that's about complaining about your boss? There's, there are those. Well, I, you know? Or do you yeah. want to create something where people are helping each other better use a product? Yeah. I, I think in maybe in your situation like in ours, we are playing to two very different audiences. Mm -hmm. And this makes our job complex, and I, I think many of your jobs too. So our ultimate success is dependent on a consumer, a user, having a very positive, compelling, emotional experience. So we really have to be on that all the time. Right? So in that way, how this new social community, which is an old message board forum, right? So this is the new, a new thing. How that looks and feels and how I can express myself easily with as little friction as possible is non-trivial to our business. So all of that design is non-trivial. And then, for us at least, I have to think about how that, what value that brings to the companies who pay, mm. <laughs> right? Because I'm not an advertising model, so I have companies, large and small, around the world who are paying to participate and curate this community. So that experience is equally important. Mm -hmm. So in many times, my um, goals, the goals for the consumer and the goals for the companies that are sponsored or involved in these are very different. Yeah. Therein lies the tantra, the tension yeah. that I as a CEO, I mean, I have to deal with that all the time. Right. Right. And it's very challenging. And so I engage smart interactive designers and visual designers. And then we have knock down drag outs on a regular basis. So, so that's right. the, that's, I want to switch it over to open it to your questions. Actually, but the, just if I may, may have just, if I can just jump in, because this is like a secret Jedi mind trick that we use um, at Zio, is that when we are listening to customers, which we do a lot, is that I listen to what the customers say and I, and I definitely write it down. Um, but that's, you know, I don't relegate the design to them, to our customers. Exactly. It's, this is still my job. I need to come in, my team, my designers, they need to come in and they need to step up to the plate and, you know, make the design better. But what I do with those questions is I well, look, this is a symptom of a deeper problem, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do when we change the design, this is our, not our to-do list, this is our to-do list in terms of, like, these are the things that we're going to have to solve, these are the things we're going to have to, these are the ways in which we're going to have to make the experience better. They may have a good, the customer may have a good idea on how to get there, mm -hmm. or we just say that's a symptom and then let's look down. And if you come out of usability without um, at least 100 issues or 1,000 issues, you know, you've done something wrong. <laughs> uh, and you, but you're not going to make 100 thousand or 1,000 changes. Instead, if you can think about it as symptoms, you go down, you, you, exactly. you, you probe down, what were the, what's the underlying system? That's right that these mm. point to. And these, the, the feedback then allows you to identify the systems, the underlying systems in your application that are causing the most issues. You then can look at changing, make a, one change, two changes in that system, and you may wipe out 20, 30 of those issues right at a go. Now that's, that's strategic design. Going back to what was said earlier, all design is strategic. All design has business outcome. And so you need to keep both things in, in hand at once. And, and it's hard, I think. It's hard when you're in a situation where you have always on feedback to not be reactive to that feedback, right? And, and, and in essence, outsource your design decisions. Yes. Right. You, you, you know, right. to your That's customer, which well is said. which is not what you want to be doing, no. right? right? It's you you safe want to thing be to do. It's like, okay, oh, they, they want they want it purple. They want it, you know, more sparkly. Yeah. They want it more, yeah. you know, whatever. And but you that could, may not suit the brand. And so, you know, you, you just throw some of them to the side. But as as Nicole was saying, it's basically using your creative judgments to interpret what they're saying. They might say a lot of black and white things, and then you take that, and that's an exercise in and of itself to take all that information and internalize it and then figure out, okay, what 
key input uh, here uh, do we need to use to refine it? And then that's all up to the creative people. And, and that's also about faith in your idea. Yes. Right? Because I think that that's, that's something that, that I see with the organizations that we serve can be really hard is that it's, they don't think they're outsourcing their design to the customer feedback. Right? Is that they lose faith <laughs> at some point yes. in what they were trying to do and they expect it to be right. And I think one of the things is, is you aren't necessarily right at any given point. You're constantly giving more feedback and as you change this, it impacts something over here. Right? And you're constantly getting more feedback and you're making those changes, but they have to be made in a way that helps you adhere and achieve on the goals that you want to achieve in conjunction with your user base. And I think, and speaking of you, um, what, what, what questions do you guys have? We, we have like um, 35 minutes left, so I hope you have questions because otherwise we're all going to sit here in uncomfortable silence. Hi. Hi. So, great, great discussion. So that last comment, I think about it as you don't necessarily give people what they want, you give them what they need. Mm -hmm. My favorite story about that is when Henry Ford was developing the first car and he listened to what people wanted, he would have made a faster pony, right? Because that's what they knew and they just wanted it a little bit different that's and right. they want a pony that goes faster. Right. But he understood the bigger value in the strategic approach and he developed a car which was transportation at a whole new level. Right. So it gave them what they needed, not necessarily what That's they wanted. That's a great analogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They started, they called it a horseless carriage just to kind of get you up the road. Yeah. Uh, and as designers, what's interesting when you innovate, when you yourselves fall into this problem, like when we were developing Tilt, uh, we uh, had patterns of drops. You know, and I have um, a 500-page script file that runs the full, pay the full version of the game, which I wrote, you know, line by line by line. And uh, we actually had to name these drop patterns, like rose and thorns, or, you know, thread the needle, or fire in the dragon, or something. And then we could literally, like an ENIAC computer, draw a picture of those patterns, and then lay them out in cards, and then shuffle those cards around to actually design the levels. It was too hard for us to, you know, put in our heads the old, you know, just the, the individual drops at once. But by naming them as a design technique, by naming them and organizing, uh, naming them, abstracted, created an extraction layer, and then we could actually then have a new a new pattern could then allow us to innovate to create something that did not exist before. And, and I think that some of the hard part there is the difference between invention and innovation, right? Because invention really is something new, yeah. and innovation is I'm con I'm constrained and I have these tools. How do I make them meet my needs? Right. And I think that a lot of us are more likely to be in positions of innovation. I'm constrained, I I, 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 you know, how do I get these tools to meet my needs versus invention? I have something that, that is, is really, really, really completely new, you yeah. know? And I, and I think that the good part of being in a space of innovation is there usually are models that you can, analogies that you can pull on, and you, you have to think about it as a constant process, right, which gets back to closing those feedback loops. So uh, other, yeah. other questions from folks? Hi. Um, I'm curious for those of us uh, who are not gamers and just maybe have sort of simple websites, how can we fold in some of these um, appealing, addictive qualities into the experience for our audience? I, I, um, I, I used to, as so I said, I worked with, a lot with small organizations and social entrepreneurs, and we used to joke that um, there was somebody at a board meeting someplace saying, give me Web 2.0 stat, you know, and, yeah. so they, and so they rounded the corners. And now we think there's somebody saying, give me games, stat, and so they're putting badges. <laughs> uh, don't, don't forget points. We need yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Oh, let's do it social. Let's give it avatars in the chat window. That'll work. Yeah, and, and so I think it, it is hard to, to think about. And I think, I think one thing as you're thinking about answering the question is, how do you do it in a way that you can maintain it as an organization? Because I think sometimes it's one, one thing for what you can design for at launch, and it's something, it, there's something else about maintaining that always on engagement o over time, maybe with a small staff, right? So it's not just the tech part. So I just want, you know, can you guys? Um, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of talk about gamification. Some people call it dumbification. Uh, you know, it's, it, but, but the point is, is that, you know, gaming mechanics are, are everywhere now. And so there is an opportunity, I think, uh, especially in education, 
to help kind of change the way we're, we're teaching, and, and in other businesses as well. And on, on sites, you know, the, for our site at least, we needed to make sure that, number one, we had the branding right for, you know, um, Her Interactive, and also for Nancy Drew. And, you know, we, within that brand, we, we wanted it to be an elegant, uh, elegant site. And, you know, with our games, uh, we work to inspire, you know, and so uh, creating delightful experiences. Um, but the, the key is, I think, you know, a lot of people are talking about just like, you know, slapping a brand in a game and expecting it to sell. I'm, uh, you know, some people are looking at these gamification things as just, oh, slap something on there and, you know, you'll, it'll work. It has to be organic and to, to what the site is or what the game is because otherwise the customer will know that you're deceiving them. You know, it has to kind of, you, you, you figure out, you know, what kind of site you're going to be and then what are some really engaging, delightful experiences or little fun games or, or things that, um, that, that tie in, that don't look out of place. I mean, it all needs to kind of fit together. And one point in addition that I think is critical, whether you're doing a website or a game or, uh, you know, an inter interactive experience, is not only do you need to listen to customer feedback, but throughout the development, you need to take a look at each milestone as a team and challenge each other and every piece of it and go, okay, is this kind of fitting that vision that we, we, were, we set out to do? Um, because there's a lot of knowledge and talent um, within the team that if you're really critically challenging yourselves along the way, as opposed to saying, oh, we know what's right, you know, it's kind of a humbling attitude that, that works. You need to be humble because if you, if you just think, oh, yeah, we're doing it right and, you know, you, you delude yourselves and then you become, um, you know, like an ostrich with its head in the sand. You can't see anymore the big picture. So, so, so it, it sounds like maybe one of the things that you, you can take other than the, the theories of practice is also um, maybe this idea of a user progressing towards a goal. Right, even even on a simple site, that if you know what your ultimate user looks like, what does your power user look like? Even if it's a simple site, maybe it's that they comment a lot. You know, that's what a power user looks like, or maybe it's that they share photos. How do you how do you show someone's progress right. towards that state in a way that they feel rewarded, but shows them off to other people? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and what it what we did. Um, uh, I started this uh, really becoming fascinated with emotions and games uh, sort of at the turn of this century. And I had this um, experience in Egypt where I found a game, discovered a game board uh, on the top of a temple uh, in Dandara. And uh, I thought about, you know, wow, 2,000 years ago, two people had stood where I stood and thought to pass their time with a game, you know, in the middle, on this temple in the middle of the desert. And I thought, well, well, in 2020, what kind of experiences would I want to have, you know, both at work and at play? And I realized that basically in, you know, 1999, um, we didn't have the tools or the language with which to describe these experiences. So, and so then I've done additional research uh, on distilling out some of these factors about how games create engagement. And I wanted to really steer us away from using the word addictive, for example, because addictive has a certain, it's a well-established well psychological phenomenon. You can design mechanics like that. But Skinner boxes are not fun. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not real fun. And, uh, I mean, some people may disagree, but I definitely, I definitely don't believe that. And so what we've done is we've actually worked with Cisco, we've worked with Blog, we've actually worked with uh, Oracle, Roxio, and we were actually partnered with Blogger on their recent redesigns of the website this year. Um, my, my firm has been involved in that. And we've taken the game-like interactions to uh, add stuff to that. And if you think about it, uh, there's a, on 4K2F, I've got a template you can actually use yourself. So that game model, the game plan to save the world, you can actually look at, well, what are the player's goals? What are your players? What is your cause? And what kind of change do you want to see in the world? And it's just a matrix. It's a, it's a four by four matrix. And so you answer these 13 questions. So you look at the goals, like let's just say the goals and the actions. So what simple, I mean, sorry, the player and, the, um, and their actions. Let's just take the A's. So what is a simple action that the players can do? And what's the simple thing? This wasn't really easy for them to do. 
Then with your cause, what's the cause of your site? I mean, are, how many people are working on social cause kind of applications or business? Yeah, a few? Most, okay. Um, but what do you want to change? And it could, the cause could be a company, you know, a kind of a company cause. And so in our case with Tilt, it was simply, you know, basically what action, how would that action tell the story of the game? So in our game, there are no buttons. You know, focus group at the uh, iPhone dev camp was like, add buttons, add buttons. But we knew that we wanted to have an experience where you just tilted between portrait and landscape. And that create, that moves the character flip, the little tadpole to eat carbon out of the air and plant seeds, just, just that. But it's easy for people to do, and it also tells the story. Like, we all want to do something to help the environment, but if we just, the, the, the tilting, just, it's like, if we just do this simple thing, you know, remove one carbon molecule, one, remove one oil drop, the world gets better. And so we're using that game to then tell the story, but the player's actions tell the story in the game, as opposed to just doing flashcards, right? Um, so, so, so it sounds like it's both giving the user a way to progress through cycles, it right, shows off, right. but then show how their actions move whatever you're trying to do as a whole forward, exactly. right? So there's, there's then, a community yeah. response. Well, then there's, there's the actions in the game. And then the last one is, well, how does that audience's, you know, your player's cause change, your audience causes change. And that last column, change, is that the till points you earn, in our game anyway, actually then make a difference in the real world. So we're partnering with We Forced. Uh, dot org to actually turn players' tilt points into real trees. We're actually going to plant real trees based on how people do in the game. Now that's an engaging experience. We've closed so many loops by, you know, providing that, that kind of thing. So in any case, there's a, there's a template up on our website, 4K2F, 4 Keys to Fun, 4K2F.com, and you can use that to uh, help you solve and help you think about. And literally, you can just, just whiteboard, marker, and Brainstorm, and you, it's not—it's not very complicated at all. Yeah, tying it together well. Uh, I mean, that's the, the next thing. But you can get started easy. Hi, I have a two-part question. Uh, the first part might be best for Wendy, and then the second part for the whole panel. But uh, as the CEO and Chief Strategy Officer of a company of one, um, I'm faced with some unique challenges. One is I find that every time I try to add an interactive feature, uh, I lose international users <coughs> on my blog. Uh, which is pretty deep. Uh, it's a news portal for Costa Rica, and I find that some of these neat things that I tend to fall in love with and reflect well on the brand adds enormous amount of size uh, to the blog and, and make it difficult for people to, to interact with it. Um, the second question is, when I sit down with typically friends who are users of this website, um, I'm trying to get feedback, yet they don't want to uh, shall we say, insult me or be too blunt. So what is the best way to get feedback from people who know and might be a part of our lives? Or, or maybe we should exclude them and just get people who don't know us. Mm -hmm. you want to answer the first part? Well, the, in terms of adding things that end up having a negative impact on international traffic, <clears throat> I think 35% 30, of our free customers inbound every day Companies, not consumers, are from non-U.S. places. And so it's very important for us to keep it simple, right? I mean, that, and that's easy for me to say because I don't come from a background of adding too much anyway. I come from a very traditional software background where everything was over-engineered and I just, it just was awful, right? So, you know, we do a lot of testing, a lot of get a lot of feedback from non-U.S. environments to make sure we keep it very simple and very clean, right? And and we we always start there. Our tendency as an organization, our dev team, our design team, is to overcomplicate. So we take too much time to think through it. We're constantly revving. I mean, and we won't push to to just see how it goes, right? It's it's amazing to me because our time to market is the, it's the biggest issue I face, right? Our market's moving very fast. I cannot take days and weeks and months to think through it, to brainstorm it. I mean, I have to get it out to let it test that way. But the international audience is a really tricky one relative to making sure you keep it simple well, and you keep their engagement. And I think that that initial point that you all made, that you have to have clear goals and understand Absolutely. where they intersect with your audience, right. This is a place where you have right. to just decide that if that's the audience you that's to call the ball. to you. You just have yeah, to call exactly. the ball. Yeah, exactly. People are going to try. You have to people pull back. People around the table, or your team, yeah. be they outsourced or insourced, are always going to make it more complex. It's just been my experience. That's just my experience. I think that's kind of the designer's role. We're, we're really captivated by this idea. We're paid to create pattern. We're not really 
create, you know, paid to create anti-pattern or reduce pattern. You know, but if you're really smart about what you do, you actually are. You are designing not to create complexity, but you're actually designing to become simpler. And, and sometimes those are just the hard calls you have to make, right? It's like, yeah, these features are great, but if we've prioritized this audience and they can't use them, the feature's not really great. And it does, <laughs> it goes back to, like, what is the expectation ultimately, yeah, yeah. right, with what audience? And, I mean, yes, you do the research, you have to do the testing, but what is the expectation? And so, you know, I kind of live in that world on a daily, hourly Minute by minute basis, right? And you know, a question that came up just on simple things that you can do in your site, though. I mean, there's so many really easy, straightforward opportunities right now to create to create engagement in a website. Mm -hmm. I mean, there really are. I'm, I don't know that they're all that well designed, but I think there's so. If you're a new business or an existing business and you're trying to engage with your customers, your consumers, your users, there are so many things you can do that are free and easy to implement um, relative to feedback even. Like there are three or four providers. We're just one of those. There are three or four providers of community. We're just one of those, right? That if I'm building, and I'm an entrepreneur at heart, I'm building a new business and I, I'm going to have a stand up a site to represent that business, I would never do that without having tools that allow me to engage right now with my customers, especially through Facebook, right? And these are not mm -hmm. expensive. These are free. You know, there's another, another, another take on this uh, question that you might, might consider is that, um, and this is very much a game design technique taken out of game context, is the idea of leveling up. And, you know, in a sense that the front page of your blog or your website or your, you know, your experience, that's going to, that's for your newbies, you know, the new people to the game and, um, or to your, to your content. Keeping that simple, accessible, streamlined, right. you know, whatever it is, just, and, and that's, and that's a good first, you know, make sure that they have a, an exceptional first five minutes and that they really want to come back. Uh, then the new features, the, your old folks, May, may tire, they may get some fatigue, and so they may want to have some new stuff. So have it in a way where they encounter this, you know, you go into the, the lobby, you know, and that's the newbie stuff, and then you're, but you are able to go to these other areas of the site, and that's where you get these new features, these new, these new kinds of experiences. Yes. Trying to throw them all in the beginning, you may just, you may just simply be looking at a usability issue where you just have too yes. many choices on the front that's page. Exactly yeah. right. It could be as simple as that, um, you know, regardless of what the localization, you know, the language stuff may, may be involved. And one, to answer your second question on how do you get real feedback, um, you know, if they're being, you said they're being too nice and they're not really being candid, um, I think establishing that trust with them is really important that they aren't afraid to give you candid feedback. I mean, when we uh, did one-on-one -on -one usability testing back in 97 with girls, first of all, there were no games for girls, so they felt they were really shy and awkward playing it and they really didn't feel like I was taking them seriously, like why would I care? And it was just kind of, I kept asking the questions and saying, oh, that's a good insight and little by little building rapport with them and now I'm happy to say we can't shut them up. So, I mean, it's really that it matters. And once they know that feedback, that, that they can be honest and really tell you what's not working, um, that's empowering on both sides. You can also find friends, I'm sure everybody has at least one that's just a little bit too blunt. And, you know, it's like I've got this and I love, I love this person to death because, you know, I put it in front of them and it's like, oh, yeah, I have to bring chocolate with me for those meetings. But, you know, because it, it, just, it just comes right out. <laughs> you can also give them permission and say an, a language trick, another Jedi mind trick, is that uh, if you, uh, you know, just say, tell them, just tell them, like, tell me three things you really like about the site first. And then that kind of gets them warms up. And then now tell me, yeah. tell me three things that maybe you don't like. Yeah. But I take it one step further and it's like, well, tell me three things like the next time we put the site out, what would you like to see there? Yeah. So it's not like I did something bad, right? It's yeah. more like, well, next time I'd really love it if you didn't move, you know, the, the login button every time I, you know, come into the right. site. You know, it'd be nice to just have one place. It, 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 that language just gives them permission to kind of. That's good. And, and the other thing is to, um, uh, position them as the experts and say, hey, you know, I'm not fresh anymore, okay, so I really need your help because I'm so close to it, I can't see it, and I'd really appreciate it if you could just give me your insights because that can help me to make the site better for you. 
Yeah. Or you just hire a friend and have them do their friends you don't want to know. We have another question here. Hi, um, this is a question for Nicole. Um, I work for education.com, which is a big parenting site. Oh, yeah. um, and we have over a million people a month downloading worksheets for their kids. And we're starting to develop um, iPhone apps. And one of the goals is to take some of that IP that we've gotten and sort of put it into a gaming experience for kids to make it more engaging for them to learn. Um, I'm noticing that there's a lot of research out there on how adults use um, gaming um, on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you've done a lot of research, and I'm curious oh, yeah. if you have some findings about how children, particularly younger children in the preschool to early elementary school set, um, use games that are fun for learning rather than just you know, yes. sounding out an anger right. yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. So if I were, um, if I had a, a, I would just plug my projector in, and we could we could show some videos. So we have testimonial, or you know, just not testimonials. I mean, these are just people talking. Um, but kids, you know, in our game, this is this is the game here where you just, you know, this is you, you just play simply by you know tilting, and that moves uh, flip down to eat the oil, and um, you know gather mushrooms and stuff like that. So all we do is just you know to get the you know, just to win. And what players tell us is that um, just by listening to them, they say, well, you know, I feel better about this game because it's about the environment, and I like saving the environment. And so having some of these themes, don't be shy. This is what we call, we have the four keys to fun. One of them is serious fun. Don't be shy about changing how people think, feel, and behave. You know, let them express their, you know, get new values, but also let them to express their values. They feel much, our audience feels much better about playing this game than they do a shooter because this is not, this is the kind of, um, they don't like the values of, of shooting games. They much prefer, you know, this game. Other games, you know, will be, you know, about, about that, but for this audience, you're matching that up. And that, um, for creating educational games um, uh, on the iPhone and, iPhone and iPad, how many people are doing mobile? Yeah, a few? Okay, just a few. Well, what's interesting is obviously the, the body size. This is awesome for the preschoolers because of the screen size, but they don't, um, they have to, this is, this is, their lap is this wide, right? It's not, you know, I mean, this is, although I can, I can put two hands here, you know, they just have these little tiny hands, and so they, they rest it on their lap. And so watch people, what I do is I actually, I don't hand it to them, I just let, let it in the lab, I just set it down and ask them to pick it up. And I look and see, you know, how they're, um, you know, how they're, how they're handling it, what, what, what it is that they do. Um, and then to get, um, but to get more content um, stuff is that uh, the, uh, for serious games, for games that have educational content, so serious games, there's a great serious games conference um, that Ben Sawyer puts mm -hmm. together. Um, I think the most important thing is to support not only, um, all games teach, right? All games teach, so let's just get over that. All games are good for us in some ways. Um, and that, that you want to have the, but you want to be sure that the message is not really explicit. Exactly. You don't want to hit them over the head with right. it. So my favorite example, and this I've done, and we did a lot, we've done a lot of instructional games for real companies. We've done work with Aston Wesley, Wells Fargo, all kinds of, um, you know, and obviously Oracle, and uh, we did Mavis Beacon Teaches Typing. We helped them with that game, uh, Mindscape with that game. But when you, if I were to give you a game um, that was a nuclear power plant simulation, so we're going to teach you how to run one of these. What's the first thing you're going to do? How many people would blow it up? How many people are blogging and <laughs> not listening? <laughs> anyway, how many people would not? How many people would not blow up a nuclear simulator? Oh, yeah, we've got a couple not blow. Oh, very interesting. Wow, I want to talk to you guys later. Yeah. Uh, usually, um, for the most part, when, we answer, when I ask this question, how many people would not try and go for a core meltdown? I mean, it's like 99%. Um, people would not, would, would go for, you know, would, I'm sorry, would go for a core meltdown. And the reason is that, you know, a game, you've, you've actually simplified the world and you've suspended the consequences and you're allowed to do something in the game that you can't do in real life. And that's, and, and because of that, you can actually learn more in a game than you can in the real world. I can, you know, I can crash my car in, you know, Grand Theft Auto. I can't crash it, I shouldn't, anyway, in, in real life. But if the game does not allow me, and the, this is Blue, Blue Fang did this great game called Zoo Tycoon. Okay, so you run a zoo, you learn all kinds of stuff about animals, very nonviolent. And um, Microsoft Research was saying, hey, you know, um, players are kind of putting the lion and, like, the antelope in, like, the same pen. <laughs> and, you know, you should do something about this. And Blue Fang was like, no, 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 this is a nonviolent game. We can't have, you know, everybody's, yeah, yeah, kumbaya, blah, blah, blah. And then Microsoft Research says, uh, no, you don't understand. It's like, everyone is putting the lion and the antelope in the same pen. <laughs> So, and you know, because it's, it's curiosity, it's how we are. And, you know, we want to drive the race track backwards. We want to put all our sims in the pool and pull out the ladders just to see what happens, right? And that's play. 
And, you know, but our clients are like, like, no, 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 no. We, we can't teach people how to blow up a nuclear power plant. We're supposed to teach them how to not. But by, you know, but, but if you don't provide that off-track play, then it's just not going to feel fun. So, like, the simplest way to create an educational game and make it more fun is really focus on what we call easy fun which is, it's the bubble wrap of game design, it's the tossing sims in the pool, pulling out the ladders, it's in Grand Theft Auto, you've got a mission you have to accomplish, point A to point B, you gotta drive your car, but then the game gives you offers like improv theater, play glass window, freeway exit ramp, and it's up for you, up to the player to accept that offer and see how they, how they interact. And I think one of the most exciting things about this time is that, um, you know, for so long, uh, learning was uncool in games and with the whole edutainment. And our games have been teaching critical thinking skills and deductive reasoning skills from the very beginning. And I used to tout that all the time when I would talk to re reporters and they were like, yeah, yeah, what else? But now that, you know, we have games that, you know, try to get out the votes and all, you know, games for change and everyone's listening again and, and really seeing the need for educational games that are so much fun you don't even know you're learning. I mean, that's what our games are about and they really do empower girls and teach them, but we don't put that on the package and they don't even know they're learning. Um, and we just, as Nicole, released our first uh, Nancy Drew iPad game book, which we took, uh, mediums are merging, which is totally interesting. Uh, because the educational system in so many ways is broken down. So we've taken elements of books and game mechanics and really created this new way of telling a story that is actually educational, um, but you'll never know it. Yeah. PEPFAR actually has done a tremendous amount of work with serious gaming with a small company called Warner Brothers, but, um, and, um, but they did a lot of it to do HIV education among youth in Africa. And what's, what's interesting about that, I mean, they had a lot of resources to throw at it, but what's interesting about it is the evaluative work that was done on how the students used it and changed it. Um, that, that has a lot of things that could be applicable and interesting. Do how many people have played Angry Birds? Yeah. Okay, now we're, now people are starting to wake up. So now you know, so basically it's an awesome game for a lot of reasons. But one thing, an example of easy fun, one missed opportunity in that franchise is that, you know when you pull, you basically pull that slingshot, you know, you pull it backwards, right, to let the thing, the little bird go. Well, what happens if you, like, pull it the other way and, like, you know, shoot it off that way? Well, the, the bird kind of goes and then it falls and that's kind of it. So making failure fun in educational context and also in, you know, games and in websites. How many people have seen a 404 error page? Kind of fun, right? Right. I mean, some of them are, right? So I like, um, what, what one was it? It was uh, GitHub has got the 404, you know, this is not the page you're looking for, and it has a, their, their character dressed up as Star Wars, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, these are not the droids you're looking for from the movie. So, you know, you can have these little moments of fun, and that can create engagement. It creates amusement, laughter, which increases social bonding, which is good. And that it ties into people fun, which is, you know, the, the, the third key. And the fourth key is, of course, hard fun, which is that challenge mastery. Another question over here. So the, the favorite way for us to zoo, use Zoo Tycoon in our house is to let the dinosaurs out of the cages and see how quickly they can eat the people. <laughs> <laughs> and so as a designer, you know, can you imagine that conversation? Like, you know, it's like, you know, you've got, you know, the business, actually the business conversation. So you're going to let, you know, these, these kids... And, you know, par our parents are going to protest. They're going to be lined up. They're going to be, like, you know, marching our, on our site to let, you know, the, the lions out of the den and the lions out and eating the people. But it's fun, right, Yeah. in this really interesting way. So, and I think that, you know, you don't want to go crazy about it. But Will Wright talks about creating interesting failure states. Um, he's built, um, you know, he's, uh, he, he, they use a lot of research, and our research, you know, went into their pool. And uh, they really design specific emotional reactions to their characters, to, different, to the new situations that they introduced in that, in that franchise. So when they change the sims, when they add a new stuff, they really, I really want to go for this emotion. I really want people to feel this, or I really want them to feel that way. And if you think about it, you want to feel curious. You want them to feel to easy fun to, to get started. You want them to feel, you know, struggle and challenge, you know, while they're working with your site. Then you want them to feel rewarded, like, yes, I did it. Yeah. You want them to feel social emotions so they bring on their friends. And then you want to feel like at the end, wow, the world's now better because of something that I did. And that's the, the four keys again. I'm, I'm curious, how many of you are working with a designer to do your website? And how many? Actually, I had a question. 
Uh, my question, sorry to interrupt, is about measurement and analytics. So nobody's really talked, of, talked about that, but it's a real key to understanding. And for example, for this lady who's looking for feedback on her website, a uh, way through technology to actually get feedback, you know, did someone complete the task, right? Or are they engaging, are they sharing? I'm, I'm, list, I'm interested to hear your all perspective on um, what you see on that front. The most important category in our business is analytics. So it, it is a very, you know, there's so many different tools right now, you know, that, that can do that. But it is, if we don't provide our customers, right, a real understanding of what their consumers are doing inside our network, we don't have a business. And so there, the research that's out right now that's being done on social analytics um, this is not just the visualization of the data, but this is the data, what the data says, how to, how to take action on the data. Um, it, it's, it is the one thing that keeps me up at night, is to be able to mm -hmm. really understand and measure every interaction mm -hmm. um, against mm -hmm. objectives for that page, for that consumer, and to be able to say to our companies that are paying for our service, here's now what you need to do with that. So I would fund, because I do angel investing as well, companies that are, are ad, new ideas around analytics, um, especially in a social context. And I don't mean omniture and, you know, the things of the past. I mean, there have got to be new ways to do mm -hmm. this. And that is, in my view, the future of all this interaction. Yep. And using an example, if we talk about gaming and social gaming, if you work with Zynga, which I do every day, because they use our products and their and their games, that's all they want to talk about. Is analytics. <laughs> because they want to be able to iterate yeah. every day, make changes in their app inside Facebook to improve the number of folks coming, how long they stay, what they buy. And so I am very, con as a CEO and leader of a company, I'm very concerned about what we're doing to provide real value in that area. So you know, people know about A-B testing, sorry, just to, I mean, A-B testing, <laughs> Okay, so that's when you basically you, you put up two versions of one web page and then you measure how many of the desired behavior you got on A and then how many of the desired response you got on B and then you move to whichever one is higher, you then move, okay, then we're going to put B and then tomorrow we're going to put up B against C, which one's better and now uh, C is better, so we do that and then we put up D, D is not better, we keep C. You, you just, it's called uh, A-B testing and you use those metrics. I was just going to say how in the in the when a when somebody's launching a new website or a product and there's a raft of data that you can potentially get and look at, right? All user visits and how long they're on this page and if they're new or returning. How do you pick the ones you really need to pay attention to? And how do you? Ha I mean, how do you make those kinds of decisions, right? So the analytics aren't just. Right. You can, you can instrument in everything, and I definitely have worked with most clients. The first thing is like, okay, we'll just instrument everything, and then you'll do that. But you can as human beings. We only measure, remember seven plus or minus two. We can only hold seven, minus, seven plus or minus two, you know, words, sounds, dwarves, whatever, in our head at the same time. Um, but what's interesting is that you can, so you, what you want to do is you want to start with, well, what are your questions? You know, what questions do you want to ask those players, and how you think about how you're going to use the answers to those questions? And then from there, you take, uh, you then, then what are the key metrics we would track for those? And then embed your system with that. And we actually use metrics. Uh, this is an example of using metrics uh, in a game, like our, uh, for our game, for uh, Tilt Flips Adventure in 1.5 Dimensions. What we did is we actually looked at, when we first released it as an iPhone uh, uh, web app, it was a free web app, we uh, looked at uh, how many people would visit. And uh, what was interesting is we only had two web pages and one YouTube video. Yet, over the course of a couple months, we drove 250,000 visits. So a quarter million people came and checked us out. Uh, and then we looked at, well, where did that traffic come from? And then um, what, was, what other events fed that traffic? And we found um, a number of different rules we then used to create our models, the models that we have at Zeo Design, of how you design you know, viral distribution. We then did this really unusual move, which is we actually launched our game on the iPad, an alpha version of our game, what we considered alpha as a launch title. We then used um, the metrics from the scores that get posted in. We have uh, scores um, inside the score. There's some stuff about how the player how the player was doing. We then used that to tune the game that we're that we're going to be releasing uh, on on Earth Day uh, for the you know, for the iPhone version. 
because uh, you can only get, you know, 100, the platform limits us to 100 beta testers, and we have a game. We want to play from here to Shanghai. So we, we, we released it that way. We were number one app on Earth Day last year, uh, top 10 app in, in 10 countries. And so we're using that data. Everyone, everyone is playing from here to Shanghai, thousands and thousands of players. We're using that data to then make that experience. We completely redesigned the first 10 levels of the game based on what we learned. Okay. Are we? I think we're about wrapped up. Are there any last questions? First of all, thank you. This is a great panel. I'm um, Carla, and I'm the founder of Wingtips. Wingtip, and it's your online closet. And I love your thought on the fail page, because we have a dog on our fail page, a really happy dog, and you can shop his closet yeah, when you open oh, it. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. But um, my thought is, my question is on as far as engagement goes with users. We have different, different opinions among, among our designers how best to use video. Because video on the site can distract somebody mm. from the core, you know, what we're trying to do is have people shop and design their closets and, you know, shop each other's closets and everything else, pull things in. And video can enhance that for some people and it can, you know, add so much, but for some people it just takes them away. So I'm very curious what your thoughts are on video and how best to use it. Okay, then. <laughs> I think, I think vi video is many places as we can put it, yeah. right? Like, especially in the product page when people are trying to understand what to buy. Also in the help section around every single category, very short um, pieces of video. We, we make big investments in that, and the, the impact has been significant in terms of folks that come to the site in the funnel, buy, stay, reduce churn. Everything I measure as a CEO is impacted as a result of video as long as it's in a short, you know, a short format. What do you mean by short? Yeah. Like two minutes. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. it has to be designed strategically too. I mean, you said that it, it was hindering you, you thought? No. no? Well, then I, I would just That's the question. wrong video. Yeah, yeah I would question. Yeah, yeah. It's too I, long. It's I, not I, the I would, content. Yeah. Or, yeah. or the placement yeah. of the video. So, right. you know, because you want them to experience kind of, okay, why are they here? And you, you want them to take them down that path. So perhaps the video isn't placed in the right place or it's too long or it's not engaging. You know, lots of different things. But video, when done well, is, is so powerful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we're good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. You've been a great audience. Thanks. So there's a short break until the uh, lunch keynote. So take a breath, take a breather, keep talking, speed dating. See you guys. And if uh, if anyone wants, I've got free stickers for our game. Everybody come play.